Yeah, hello. Uh, are you, are you uh -huh. Good morning. Or a few minutes. Few minutes. Are they in the free version? Nala, forty minutes. Oh, I know, I know. I know. Hold it, Anga. It is the eleven, Anga. Okay. Hello. Good morning, Mohan. Yeah. Hi, hello. I am coming. I am very early. Fast, fast. I am alone. So I am not going to take less. Right. No, I cut it. I am not video. No. Yeah. Right. No, no. 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 Welcome, of the yeah, I, it, it came only in my iPad, the computer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. As I said in the landmarks, atomic landmarks, the correct Nexus is the hero because that gives us the entry point to the, uh, the area, uh, which is the lateral crisis. And the flocculus is the villain because it covers the, the entire uh, region. So if you have a large flocculus, then you have difficulty accessing the region. Another interesting point is that the cranial nerves 7, 8, and 9 form a triangle, not an equilateral triangle, but a triangle nevertheless. So if you have an absence of eighth nerve, if you have the seventh and the ninth nerve, then by looking at the positions of seventh and eighth, more or less you can triangulate and find out where is the approximate position where you will expect the eighth nerve to have been present. So you can actually use this also as a rough indication for the area. Now, uh, the other uh, structure which you have is a straight vein. And the straight vein is a constant structure which is always present. And when it's present, it leads you directly to the uh, cochlear nucleus. So that's again a very useful structure. I'll show it to you in a minute. Now, in the, in the, in the, when you're actually doing the surgery, if you're not able to locate the lateral crystals, then usually what we do is we tell the anesthesiologist to do a valsalva. And they can do a valsalva with their, uh, uh, you know, uh, the back, and you will see the CSF coming out, and that area will tell you that this is where the lateral process is. So this is a important uh, anatomical picture, which shows you the region in question. Here you can see the the choroid plexus here. This whole area is a choroid plexus here, and you can see the lateral process. You can see the straight vein. And you can see the flocculus which is hiding the lateral crisis. So this is what I was talking about here. Of course, the pons and the medulla and the, the sulcus between them. Okay, so this is the area. This is the first cerebral layer. And this is an intraoperative picture which actually shows you the same thing. Now, uh, this is the uh, lateral crisis entry point, and you can see the the brain are entering. This is a uh, again, this uh, shows you a, uh, a very uh, seventh, eighth nerve complex with hyperplastic cochlear uh, uh, nerve, and you can see the uh, the, the brainstem uh, here, uh, and uh, this is the entry point. So this is a, a surgical video. There are just a few important steps for the incision to be used. And uh, once you're elevated, you do a, this is the master plus, this is the right side. So you're doing a retro sigmoid. Uh, of course, that's the sigmoid sinus here. This is here. Below the cancer sinus, behind the retro the sigmoid sinus, is the area that we expose. And we open the neura, check out the CSF. We open the systems and allow the CSF to flow. And the moment the CSF flows out, the entire uh, the cerebral left will choroid plexus here. You can see the choroid plexus here and the pyarachnoid, which is and uh, you, this is the uh, uh, seventh nerve and the ninth nerve. Uh, 
you see here and the tenth nerve here. So the ninth nerve is usually the guide. We follow the ninth nerve, and the ninth nerve will usually take you straight into the darkness. So this is the ninth nerve which is being followed, and you can see the, the uh, implant going in. It's a plate like electrode, a plate of optical implant, which is a, uh, a long uh, linear electrode. This is a, a flat electrode. And the same cochlear implant principle, but it is made into a plate. And you can see each, each one of them circles is an electrode. And this is gently now pushed into the process till the point of first resistance. So you gradually, you very gently push it in as atraumatically as possible till you meet your first resistance and then you stop. So this, you want, this is important because as I told you in the beginning of the lecture, we want to access the dorsal pocket. So the, the deeper you go, the more chances are that you will be accessing the dorsal pocket. So once the electrode goes in, then a bit of soft tissue is in, and then it is kept there in position and to seal off the area and to stabilize the electrode. But this is important because the brain, apart from the heart, the only other structure which goes on pulsating is the brain. And the brain has a nasty habit of pulsating and pushing everything out. So to avoid the electrode being extruded, you need to stabilize it. So this is the surgical reason. Now, in the brain cell implant surgery, it's a little more complicated than a cochlear implant. Here, you have to do a lot of electrophysiological uh, work both during the surgery and after the surgery. During the surgery, you have to monitor the cranial nerves. And you have to monitor the seventh cranial nerve, the ninth, and if you can. These are all uh, intraoperative monitors. Channel monitoring of all the parts. And after the surgery, you then do what is known as an electrically evoked auditory process. That is, you stimulate the electrode and you try and record the brain cell response. Now, why is this important? Because you are entering into a very, very, very important neighborhood. And in this neighborhood, there's a VIP neighborhood. There are a lot of important structures very close to the and you don't want to be stimulating the wrong structures because these are important structures. So even respiratory center, even the cardiac center, they're all not very far away from where you are. So you want to make sure that your electrode is in the right way. And therefore, it's producing auditory responses, not non-auditory responses. So by doing this, you do this electrically auditory based. This is how it looks. Now, typically, in an uh, electrically evolved brain cell response, you have three waves. You have the, the first and second wave, which you get in an AVR, uh, you don't get because that's from the periphery. Here, only from the cochlear nucleus you get. So you get the third, fourth, and fifth. And this is, uh, the, the third is from the cochlear nucleus, fourth is from the olivary nucleus, and fifth is from the lateral nucleus. So the three of them uh, can be usually added. But in actual practice, if you get anything from one to and they are known as, they are termed as P1 to P3. Now, uh, this is a, a typical cochlear implant response. They get all the five, and here you get only three, P1, P2, and P3. And this is a, a good response. This is a lot of electrical noise. This is no response. So you can uh, quantitate properly. And you also, by increasing the strength of the stimulus that you're giving, what is an amplitude growth. And also the latency becomes less and less as the strength of the stimulus goes up. So this tells you that you are actually producing an So these are the uh, ranges of the latency, P1 to P3, and uh, this is the average that you are getting. EABR can be correlated later on with the outcomes. There's usually a fairly good uh, outcome. What do I mean? Uh, when you get very robust EAPR responses intraoperatively, which means you are exactly on the spot, you are stimulating the cochlear nucleus, postoperatively, these children tend to do much better in their uh, outcomes. Uh, now, once this is done, you close up, you allow it to heal. In a cochlear implant, switch on is usually done two to three weeks after the surgery. But in a brainstem implant, you are longer because you are allowing the brainstem to recover and to heal. 
So this takes about six to eight weeks. So we usually give a, a period of six to eight cooling period, after which the switch on is done. The switch on is very, very important in a pressure environment. It's always done in a ICU setting or in the operation theater. Anesthetics done by because you may be inducing for the child even a cardiac uh, cardiac arrest. So you have to have everything available for a full resistance patient. And then a switch on is done with the full uh, anesthetics. And uh, what we are looking for is non-auditory stimulation. So what are these non-auditory stimulations? You can get a little bit of tingling sensation in your arms or hand or even the lower limbs. The visual field may be bobbing because of vestibular stimulation. This is known as the jittering of the visual field. Sometimes they may have jerks, the motor responses, and vertigo if the vestibular stimulus is so you need to look out for all these things. It's not very easy in a child. It's very, very difficult. But you have to be very sharp and be looking up for any sensation of unpleasantness in the child. You can also verify, of course, uh, with the CT scan, which we do immediately post-operative to make sure that you are doing the right scan. How does it work? Now, this is a, a video which I'm going to show you of a child called Justin, uh, which is done about two years after the uh, patient. Now, what's important is that we uh, look at the way he's saying it. Oh, Papa, ah, ah, ah. Now, that's known as a prosody of speech, the rhythm of speech. Prosody or the rhythm of speech tells you a very important information, and that is the child is listening to his own speech, which means that his hearing is present. He is monitoring his own speech. So, of course, it's not you know, the speech is not uh, in two years in a cochlear implant will be much better. But nevertheless, uh, you can't compare a cochlear implant with the brain. You can't compare an orange with an apple. They're two different things and they work completely differently. But if you compare a child who's had no implantation, the bilateral absent cochlear, and put him through what we call total communication, it really means no communication. That is sign language and, and you teach them uh, some amount of speech. You, you will notice that the speech of the child is flat, no prosody at all. Whereas in an ABI, the child develops this prosody. That tells you that the child is monitoring or listening to his own speech. So I want to share with you some of our experience. Now, basically, our pediatric ABI in Murph, we've done about 51 cases, one of which was a review. This, uh, as interestingly, happens to be the largest series in the world at the moment. And, uh, you know, they, we are uh, gradually increasing the numbers. Uh, now, I'm looking at the outcomes in about 34 of these who had sufficiently long uh, follow-up. And this is the series. Uh, and you can see that uh, what is known as a CAP score, which is a category of auditory person. So CAP and SIR are very standard ways of assess assessing hearing and speech. In implanted children, both for cochlear implants and for brain cells. And uh, they, they were uh, described by uh, Otto Hugh et al. a very standard uh, uh, reference. Of, you know, we, we have an increasing scale and it tells you exactly how the child is performing. So this is an internationally accepted nomenclature which everybody uses. So, in a, a brain cell implant, within a 12 month period, you have sufficient improvement with the auditory perception. The, in the CAP score, the category of auditory perception score, uh, and you can see the p value is very low. Similarly, also in the speech intelligibility rating, SIRT stands for speech intelligibility, CAP code, category of auditory perception. Both of them, you can see that there has been an improvement. Now, looking at the long term, you know, the, what is important in creation of blood is that the habilitation in the cochlear implant usually we give for a year. But in a brain stem implant, you have to continue for more than that. You have to much longer. For two, three years, three years is minimum we recommend. Because we have seen in our children that many of them continue to progress gradually, even after two years. 
even up to three years or even four years, they may gradually be picking up. So you cannot stop. You have to go on giving them uh, you know, at least for three years. And when you look at the, a, a small number of, of them, a whole lot of tests were done for them, very detailed evaluation to see their outcomes. And we could see that you know this is a Sultan period, and the end as a two years. And we could see that uh, at least uh, of these seven uh, were male, three female, and all were bilateral aplasia children. And you could see that there was definitely an improvement in 24 months. And uh, if you look at the p-value, it is very, very low. So definitely these children were improving compared to more. And this is a, a rough idea of outcomes. This is a normal child. This is the regression curve for a cochlear implant. You can see that initially they are, you know, below the normal child. They are gradually catching up. Eventually, they will catch up in about two years' time with the normal child, provided we do them young enough. In an ABI, see one ABI, uh, and second ABI, third, they are all going even better than a cochlear implant, or even, uh, you know, nearing a, a normal response. But in about three, they are about average. In about another two or three. They are not doing well. So there is a rate. Almost all of them will depend on both oral and sign language. We encourage them to use sign language with oral. So it's a total communication. But the difference between oral communication without an implant and with implant is they're hearing a lot better and therefore their oral communication is far, far better. Now we also do cortical auditory vote potentials. Now, what are these? These are late latency responses recorded from the auditory part. And it's interesting because it's a biomarker for auditory cortical methodology. What do I mean? Now, if you look at the cortical load potentials at birth, it's not present. In about three months' time, it starts making a I'm talking about normal hearing child. In six months, it's very well formed. In a year's time, it is fully matured, which is understood. So in this one year, the auditory experience in the cortex, child as it's hearing more and more, the auditory experience makes the curve mature. So by looking at the curve, you will know by the evolution of the curve that not only is this person hearing, but it's actually it is developing a, an auditory experience and an auditory memory. And these are people who are developing a, a normal uh, auditory function. So it's a biomarker for auditory cortical maturation. The auditory cortex is getting mature. So in ABI, interestingly, our uh, uh, group was the first to show that we could also develop cortical auditory vote potentials in ABI. This is very important because it was a very it was the first uh, tangible electrophysiological evidence to say that. These children were not only hearing, but they were also capable of developing auditory cortical. So this was an important finding, and it very strongly supported the uh, evidence for the functioning of brain cells. So yeah, there are some ex examples of that, and you can also notice that the amplitude growth is also seen. In other words, the stronger your response, the better the uh, that's again a very important uh, 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 indicator for auditory cortical maturity. So basically, it's a cortical level potential is a good electrophysiological parameter to assess the overall prognosis and assess electrodes which are not accurate. What do you mean? Now, if the CAEP is very well formed in a particular child, now this child is child is going to be doing very well. You can make make very uh, clever predictions that this is going to be a good performer. And also, if particularly you can test groups of electrodes and say if any one of them is not producing your potential, you can say this is non auditory electrode. Very helpful. And uh, the, uh, now coming to the flocculus. I told you the flocculus is the villain because it's covering the cellular. So our group also started looking at the variance of flocculus and see how it is going to be impacting the surgery. So we divided the flocculus into four. Grade one, two, three, four. Now this application is now accepted internationally by all the brain cell implant surgeons. And uh, grade one is where the flocculus is not present, where you have a large choroid plexus. Interestingly, the flocculus and the choroid plexus seem to have an inverse relationship. Wherever the flocculus is small, the choroid plexus is large, and vice versa. 
So in grade one, you have a large choroid plexus. In other words, the hero is very prominent. Villain is very, very, uh, is not present at all. In grade two, the flocculus is present. It's a little rostral or uh, near the roof. And uh, the choroid plexus is still very prominent. In three, the flocculus is small, more central, but the choroid plexus is also small. In four, the flocculus is large and the choroid plexus is small. So here's just an example of that. This is a left brain uh, implant, and you can see the, the flocculus uh, uh, is, is there. The choroid plexus is completely absent. In grade two, the flocculus is more central. Here it is more rostral. Flocculus uh, here. This is central and the uh, basically the uh, uh, flocculus is sorry the correct plexus is uh, central the flocculus is very very small in three you can see that the uh, where the, the flocculus has become much more prominent correct plexus is here and in four there is no correct plexus but a very very large flocculus obviously a large flocculus no correct plexus is going to be a so when we looked at our series of 25 patients, almost two thirds of them were either grade one or two, which is good news. So 64 percent of them were grade one or two, which is good. And about a third of them were grade three and four, which is going to be good surgery. So in grade three and four, we noticed that the difficulty was more in the experimentally implant and more Cerebellar retraction was required, and we don't like cerebral retraction. Whenever you cause cerebral retraction, you cause cerebral edema, and they have a very strong postoperative pain. And uh, always the ninth nerve was the guide when we, we could not identify the coronavirus. And uh, the in one and two, of course, the entry point was very easy, and uh, you could see the uh, point very clearly. But interestingly, the grading based on flocculus had no uh, correlation with that. In other words, just because you had an easy access, it didn't mean the outcome was any better. We also looked at the vestibular dysfunction. Why vestibular dysfunction? Boom, but flocculus is the, the vestibular part of the cerebral. The flocculus and the nodule, what is known as a flocular nodular uh, lobe of the cerebral. It's the vestibular part of the cerebral. It stands to reason if you're going to be going and poking around the flocculus, these children will have post operative dysfunction. So, of these 25 children, four of them developed vestibular dysfunction. Of this, in uh, three, the main problem was unsteadiness. This is not falling around post operative Because they fall around, bang their head, the, they may damage the blood. In one, there was not only a, a unsteadiness, but there was severe vertigo, work, and see nystagmus in this child. So that is a very, very severe. And uh, in all four patients, uh, you know, we they were either grade three or four, and we were manipulating the calculus. Uh, so that explains why they had the problem. In grade three, out of four patients in grade three, only one had vertigo. But in grade four, out of five patients, Three of them, almost 60 percent risk of developing. In other words, grade four significantly increases the risk for postoperative vertigo. What about complications? I think of the 50 children who had the implant. Interoperative complications, you know, mainly it is non auditory stimulation. So, interoperatively, you're testing the electrode and you find non auditory stimulation, then you reposition the audiologist tells us, and then we reposition the electrode till we get the AVR. And uh, but serious non artery stimulations were not seen in any of the patients, like cardiac arrest or you know, respiratory. Uh, uh, just, uh, two patients had post operative CSA, and they were treated conservatively, usually by a lumbar drain. And then, uh, another interesting technology which we have used is known as near infrared spectroscopy. This is the latest tool that we have. Or assessing the, the temporal or, or auditory area of the brain, the temporal cortex, whenever we produce. So, in, in anybody who is, uh, whenever you are uh, stimulating the, uh, the hearing, uh, the auditory brain uh, gets stimulated and the ratio of the oxy to deoxyhemoglobin is measured here in front of the spectroscopy in IRS. 
and uh, if it highlights it, it tells you that the uh, person is here. So this is a good tool for assessing uh, in a, a child. Whether it's not a cochlear implant or a patient implant. The advantage is unlike MRI, this is compatible uh, in, in a child who's had an implant. This is a person who's had a basic implant, but there's no audit. So you know that this electrode is not functional. But this is a child who had a revision. So what about the future? We are now looking at what is known as the sleeper area, in particular in the NF2 patient. That is, if the patient got two uh, tumors, so you're taking out the first side tumor, you put in an ABI, but you don't stimulate it. The other side is still here. Then the other side tumor also grows, and let's say uh, six months or one year later, you have to operate on the other side. At that time, you remove the tumor on the other side, but you activate the implant on the first side. So this is known as a sleeper area. Particularly uh, was developed in, in uh, Manchester, uh, and they are a group who have been doing this. Uh, and more and more indications are coming up for ABI. I told you some of them, like an IP1, but today is an indication for ABI. Uh, can we do implant in a deformed brainstem? You know, a large vestibular schwannoma distorting the brainstem. Can we do it? Well, you can do it, but you know, you can be sensible to assess the the brainstem uh, position uh, with an MRI preoperative. But I said that you can assess the size of the cochlear nucleus. First, the cochlear nucleus straddles the infestible peduncle. And in MRI, they have different signals. So you can make out the infestible peduncle and the surrounding area, and you can make out the, uh, the size of the nucleus. As our MRI technology improves, we are hoping that they can actually volumetrically assess the size of the cochlear nucleus. If we get the actual volumetric data of the size of the problem, it will be very, very helpful for the pre-operative field, whether we'll be able to uh, get good results with the brain We're now looking at endoscopic techniques because, you know, in a child, you don't want to make a big craniotomy. Of course, you know, you do a retrocephal craniotomy. So we try, we're trying ABI uh, with endoscopes. Uh, in fact, in our uh, group, we are not. We are what we are doing now is we are doing a, a, a flap technique where we actually make a retrosynoid window and then reposition the the osteoplastic flap, the skull back, so that it it covers up nicely. Then they do heal very well. Bilateral ABI, yes, it is definitely something which we should think about, but not bilateral simultaneously. You do one side first, give a gap of one year or so. And then do the other side. And definitely, we know from experience of cochlear implant, bilateral implants do better than single. And we are also trying to work out better speech coding strategies, knowing that the way the coding is done in the brainstem is different from the cochlear. We are using the same strategy both in the cochlear implant as in the brainstem implant, but that can't do because we know that the way the brainstem functions is different. So we have to work out better speech coding strategies, and that is now. You the, uh, the cadaver the endoscope assisted thing. Um, what does the future hold? So, we, as I said, we already have techniques for assessment of the public, and uh, also the, uh, the, the uh, variations in the type of electrode. So, we are asking, uh, you know, we're asking for different uh, shapes of the electrode. The lateral recess shape can vary from person to person. And uh, we want the electrodes much closer to the neural targets. And switch processing uh, coding strategies have to be better, said, and also better assessment tools like CAEP, PET scans, and uh, even an IRS. Optogenetics this is a very interesting concept, both for public implants and for brain implants. Instead of having electrical stimulation, why not use optical stimulation right, as, a, uh, as a stimulus? So this is done by uh, having a gene uh, inserted by a virus. Uh, and this gene uh, causes, produces a light sensitive protein called opsin synthroids. This is known as a channel or opsin 2 or CHR2. The electrode, whether it's an AB electrode or a popular electrode, electrode, will deliver a blue light. And this blue light will excite the, the sensitized cochlear nucleus neurons. And in the case of popular implant, the, uh, the uh, neurons of the audiologists. And then basically the advantage of using the light as a source of stimulus is it produces 
much more precise and it can produce a lot more channels for electrical than in the current ones. So what next? Auditory midbrain implants. So if we can put in the brain stem, we cannot put it in the midbrain. So inferior colliculus is very tempting because inferior colliculus is even more accessible than the brain stem. Very easy to access. Already the group in Hanover in Germany, Thomas Lenars and, and group have done about seven uh, uh, midbrain implants where they put implants into the inferior colliculus. Unfortunately, you know, only about uh, two of them have actually had a genius uh, situation. Um, uh, four or five of them didn't get very well. But obviously, this is very, very early days and we need to do uh, more work on that. But we understand the distribution of the tone opacity in the brain. And what about cortical implant? That would be great because it's right on the surface. You don't have to go in at all. You can just put a, a plate on the cortex. But we need to have much more about the distribution of different So what are the lessons we have learned? It's an evolving surgery. Pediatric ABI particularly is definitely an evolving surgery. It is difficult surgery, but it is safe and it seems to be worth the effort. And uh, we need to do it early in children. This is the problem in advantage of plasticity. We know that central auditory organization takes place. We can actually see this evolution of this reorganization. And it's an important tool in addition to the EABR as a And as I said, CAAP or particle auditory work potentials are a good biomarker versus the auditory integration, phonemic awareness, auditory discrimination, as well as speech. And our group there a lot of uh, simple grading of the formulas and this helps the surgeon to predict the difficulty in inserting the electrode. And we also know that uh, a larger prominent flocculus in grade three and four in the will lead to more post western distributions. So with that I stop. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Any questions I'll be more than happy to Uh -huh. yeah, no, okay. Yeah. Right. okay, now PG is PG is any question? They didn't understand. I would like to first ask them. There's a little high, high on topic. So if you don't understand, there's nothing wrong in that. They can always ask. Them. Why let a phone open money can go phone open money can you get in there? Ready, sir. Is the implant with MRI compatible? So we can take the MRI in future, sir. Ah, good, very good question. See, uh, the companies will tell you they are all MRI compatible. The latest uh, uh, implants which are available are MRI compatible. We must understand what is MRI compatibility now. When you have an, uh, in the latest generation of both cochlear implants and brainstem implants, when the company says it's MRA compatible, what it means is up to 1.5 Tesla, you don't have to remove the electrode. Okay, so you don't have to remove it. You just have to put a restraint with a bandage and then you can send the patient for an uh, MRA. But the electrode will, show, will throw a, a shadow. And this shadow will hide quite a bit of the surrounding area. So if you're going to be doing an MRI in a person, or MRI brain, a person who, let's say, had a head injury with an implant, then the, it's not very useful because that the shadow will cover the area that you're going to be looking for. So in that respect, a CT may be more limited, actually. So when you say MRI compatible, what you're trying to say is that you don't have to remove the implant. It doesn't mean that the implant will not throw a shadow over the surrounding. Am I clear, Rashmi? 
Uh, sir, I have a doubt, sir. Uh, is there any age limit, sir, like uh, be only beyond which an ABI can be done? Well, the youngest we have done is about one and a half years old, okay. 18 months. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's no harm. I mean, if, if a child is uh, one year uh, plus, I wouldn't hesitate. Now, the uh, Important thing, uh, I mean, whether it's uh, ABI or cognitive plan, is not the chronological age, it is the weight of the baby. Uh, in general, anesthetists would like to have a baby who's at least eight months, you know, doing a long procedure. And the reason is that below, uh, you know, uh, eight kgs, a very small baby may not have developed the cardiovascular uh, and hemodynamic reflexes very well. So those are children who are, uh, you know, at risk in the That is the reason why I'm sure Bala will uh, be able to contribute there as well. In general, pediatric anesthetists would like to have a baby who is at his age, particularly if it's an electrical, not an emergency. You can't wait a bit. So generally speaking, we wait for the baby to get his 8 kgs. Then only take it. They okay, prefer sir. 10 kg, preferably uh, more. Yeah. Even 10 would be, the would be time. What the normal time duration? Here, there, there is a trade-off. We are having a trade-off between the how soon you want to do and the weight of the baby. So you have a trade-off. So you are trying to do it at the earliest to get the best results, but at the same time you don't want to be compromising or risking the baby. So you are you're, there's a bit of a you know, so our uh, anesthetists generally say at least eight kgs. At eight kgs, and as Bala said, you know if it's ten kgs is even safer. Okay, sir. The duration of surgery generally is about three hours. You know, initially when we started, we were doing about four five hours. Gradually, it has come down. Now, we actually do the surgery in about one and a half hours, but another one and a half hours will be spent on all the radiophysiological testing. That's very important. It takes as much time as a surgery. So, basically, the whole thing from skin to skin will take about three hours. Electrode yeah, differences in uh, ABI and cochlear implant. What are the elect electrode differences? Sir? Because very cochlear very implant. Good. Yeah, very good question. Actually, it's exactly the same. The cochlear implant and API, the electrode is exactly the same. The only difference is in the way it is presented. In a cochlear implant, you have a linear electrode, which you want to insert into the cochlear. In an ABI, it's a plate electrode. So the same electrodes are distributed in the form of a plate. But the same number of electrodes. In a, in a cochlear implant, you have 12 pairs of electrodes. In an ABI, you have 12 pairs of electrodes. But you put it in a flat way, in a, in a uh, uh, flat form, uh, and so that you can actually insert it into the flat uh, of So it's the same thing, exactly something. And even the speech coding strategies are the same, as I said already, which is actually not a correct thing, you know, because we have all been complaining about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, engineers and acoustic engineers are all working. Uh, uh, they have to, you know, definitely develop different strategies for the brain. It's common sense. But the problem is we don't understand the way the brain cell functions even now completely. This is why the strategies that they have to do is, has to be totally, it has to be trial and error. They have to go on developing strategies with patients and see which works out better in each patient. That's the only way. It's a very... Uh, Mohan, regarding AVT, we do for the cochlear implant, no. What about here? Yeah. In here, the auditory habitation in an ABI has to be much longer. Uh, you know, even three or four years, as opposed to one year in a cochlear implant. And the reason is that we have seen in our group of children, it's not a big number, 50 is not a big number, of course. But, it's, it's, you know, this is a very rare surgery. Uh, in our